All right, Phil Lee returning with another episode of Civil War Chat. This is Saturday, the 26th of December, 2020. And today is uh, the topic is Grant versus Lee. A lot of what's a lot of what's going on with the hostility towards Lee, you know, tearing down his statues, the Washington and Lee University can, considering removing the name Lee from the school. Although they say it has to do with morality about uh, you know, slavery and racism and all that sort of thing. It all really got started about 40 years ago uh, by a, a, a small group that became a large group of historians who really wanted to uh, elevate uh, Grant's reputation. And they figured the best way to do that is to tear down Lee's reputation, primarily because Lee's reputation would be, would be impossible for Grant to meet. So they wanted to tear down his reputation by creating phony reasons for uh, um, criticizing him. Uh, so what I want to do is first, let me uh, uh, again point you to the uh, notification bell in the upper right, far upper right of the uh, screen that you're looking at here, uh, outside the frame of where I am and uh, you know my video, but go up into the screen and, and find the YouTube notification bell and click on that. You'll be notified whenever I have a new uh, video. Let me go ahead now and pull up my notes so I can discuss with you uh, Grant versus Lee, because when the two of them actually met, we, we, we see who is the better one. One of the reasons the cultural elite attacks Robert E. Lee today is because selected historians wanted to tear down his reputation in order to lift that of Ulysses Grant. It began in 1981 when William McFeely's Grant biography won the Pulitzer Prize, which enraged a small cabal of historians because it was at times critical of their hero. It was not the hagiography hey, that these guys demand each new uh, Grant biography be. During the ensuing decades, they so distorted Lee's performance that by 2015, our military academies, such as the Naval Academy, such as the uh, uh, West Point, have been teaching that Grant was the best general of the war between the states. And this opinion is erroneous for at least three reasons. First, Grant nearly always had a sizable resource advantage over his opponents, even when he fell short of having a su significant numerical advantage in soldier strength, he generally had the coupled power of the United States Navy. Even the inferior Confederate commanders at Vicksburg and Fort Donelson for example, could have evacuated their armies had not the Federal Navy prevented escape across the Mississippi and Cumberland rivers, respectively. Even in Virginia, had the Confederate Navy, let's say, had been a match for the Federal one, Grant could not have sneaked his, the first several corps of his army across the James River to open attack on lightly defended Petersburg, while leaving most of Lee's army north of the river. Similarly, if the Confederate Navy had had control of the Tennessee River at Shiloh, Grant's army could not have been rescued by Buell's army on the second day of the battle because Buell would have had no way of getting across the Tennessee River. And without Buell, Grant's army was doomed. Second, especially with Grant under control. And Sherman is, I guess, kind of a second in command there. Second, Aside from being prone toward drunkenness, Grant's personal conduct sometimes put his army at risk. At Shiloh, for example, he appropriated the Cherry Mansion for his headquarters and, it, and was therefore about 10 miles away from his armies when the Confederates launched their surprise attack, which should not have been a surprise if Grant had been around. In contrast, well, he'd been around and done his job. In contrast, Lee normally slept in a tent among his soldiers, and that is one reason they respected him. He suffered with them. He bore their hardships. Grant, man, he goes off into a mansion, and you know it's a mansion owned by Southerners, so they probably have slaves to do all the cooking and everything, wait on Grant, and all that sort of thing. So yeah, that's what Grant liked to do. Lee, now he slept in a tent most of the time. In the winter, of course, they had winter quarters. Uh, which typically were, you know, outdoor huts. All right, now let's go, let's proceed. At Cold Harbor, Grant ordered one of the most reckless frontal assaults of the war against Confederate entrenchments. After it was quickly repulsed with appalling casualties, he ordered it renewed. 
but many of the soldiers refused to advance a second time. At best, they remained in place and opened fire from where they lay in order to create the illusion of an attack by sound, if not by sight. Grant compounded his misconduct by leaving most of the dead and wounded, his, between enemy lines for three days out of stubborn refusal to request a conventional truce to rescue them. When he finally capitulated, few of the wounded had survived. They had lain out in the hot sun uh, and then the, the long nights uh, for three days. Lee suffered 5,000 casualties in this battle as compared to 12,000 for Grant during the multi-day event. But on the day that Grant made his five core assault against Lee's entrenchments, Lee's casualties totaled only 1,500 as compared to 7,000 for Grant. Third, the thrashing that Grant received after about only one month of tangling with Lee in four battles left his army so afraid of the enemy that they let the golden opportunity of capturing lightly defended Petersburg slip away after they, after they first crossed the James River and confronted the lightly defended Confederates at Petersburg. As a result, it would take Grant another nine months to get into Petersburg. Moreover, the losses he suffered against Lee in May and June of 1864 left Lincoln with the opinion that the voters would not reelect him as president when the autumn elections arrived. Lincoln was saved by the fall of Atlanta and not by anything that Grant had done except hold Lee in stalemate. The following is an excerpted and edited version of Joseph Rose's analytical summation of the 1864 Overland campaign where Grant first met Lee during this 40 days. And it comes from uh, Rose's book, Grant Under Fire. Grant began his 40-day campaign against Lee with an approximate two-to-one numerical advantage. He had 124,000 troops compared to 66,000 for Lee. At the end, Grant had suffered 55,000 casualties, which was also about twice as large as Lee. Grant had thereby earned the epithet butcher from his own soldiers and Northern civilians, not Confederates, nor members of the so-called law school of civil war, uh, lost cause school of civil war history. It was not the so-called lost causers that called Grant a butcher. It was the Yankees themselves, the contemporary Yankees. Losses for the two sides during the battles of the wilderness, and this is stunning when you think about it. Losses for the two sides during the battles of the wilderness Spotsylvania and Cold Harbor correspond closely to the federal disasters at Second Bull Run, Chancellorsville, and Fredericksburg. Talk to anyone casually acquainted or moderately acquainted with the Civil War and ask them about those losses at Second Bull Run, Chancellorsville, and Fredericksburg. Oh, those are disasters, they'll say. But then ask about Wilderness, Spotsylvania, and Cold Harbor. Oh, well, that's where Grant began to show Lee, how to really fight the war. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Wilderness, Spotsylvania, and Cold Harbor, the losses at those three so-called Grant victories correspond closely to the federal disasters at Second Bull Run, Chancellorsville, and Fredericksburg. All three Union generals in charge of Second Bull Run, Chancellorsville, and Fredericksburg lost their positions. They were replaced. One was run out to Minnesota to deal with Indians. The other one, another one went to uh, uh, help um, Rosecrans in Tennessee. And then Burnside, who was the general in charge at Fredericksburg was demoted. Ulysses Grant had finally, quote, met Lee, although not with the results he expected. Each of his four maneuvers, passing through the wilderness to open country, reaching Spotsylvania first and crossing the North Anna River and flanking Lee at Cold Harbor, each had failed. Each of his three major engagements ended in defeat. The stalemating of Grant constituted a major Confederate victory, 
which was reflected in Lincoln's potential for electoral defeat. Although he stumbled a few times, Lee ably met a force nearly twice the size of his own. Grant never came close to his goal of bringing Lee's army into an open battlefield and beating it. In fact, Grant's massive losses in only 40 days during May and June of 1864 destroyed the effectiveness of his army for the rest of that year of 1864. This is no great performance by Grant. This is a bad performance by Grant. He does not deserve the credit that modern historians are giving him. Now, I want to bring to your attention my book, Grant's Failed Presidency. Okay, you can get a copy of this book at Amazon or any you know online bookstore, any bookstore, they can order it for you. U.S. Grant's Failed Presidency. It's $20. If you'd like a signed copy, I'll sign it for you and deliver it to you here in the United States for $25. Grant was even worse as a president than he was as a general. Worse. He, he was, there was so much corruption, financial corruption in his two terms. It's probably not been matched since then. And a lot of people is like, well, they will take the point of view that, well, you know, Grant was personally honest. He was just not a good judge of the people that he brought in to help him. Well, let's take a look at that. One of the biggest scandals in that, in, in, in his, uh, in one of his two administrations was a scandal to uh, buy uh, liquor producers to avoid paying excise tax. This was before income tax. So excise taxes were big. Tariffs were number one. Tariffs are number one. You know, that's, see, the Yankees wanted tariffs because that kept manufacturing monopolies north of the Ohio River and Mason-Dixon line. That was number one important. It was also number one revenue. But another two revenue during this period was, was excise taxes, particularly on things like alcohol. Okay, that was a big scandal because what happened in Grant's administration is, well, these alcohol man, these uh, whiskey makers did not want to pay the tax, right? They don't want to pay taxes. How can they get out of paying the tax? Well, they can bribe administration officials in the Treasury Department. Yeah, Grant officials. Now, eventually what happened is things began to leak out like these things often do. And so Grant had to replace his uh, Secretary of the Treasury, and he got in a guy who was a you know squeaky clean, or certainly by comparison. Benjamin, uh, what was his name? Uh, shoot, Benjamin Bristow became Treasury Secretary. So finally, through Bristow's work, and uh, he hired detectives, and they found out all this was going on. They brought charges against uh, a number of people. And here's what the uh, chief clerk of the uh, Treasury Department said to uh, future Supreme Court Justice uh, John Harlan. What has hurt Bristow, the Treasury Secretary, worst of all, is the final conviction that Grant himself is in the ring ring meaning the ring of corruption, a ring of corrupt group of people and knows all about it. I'll repeat that. What has hurt Bristow, the treasury secretary, the most appointed by Grant to clean up things, what has hurt Bristow worst of all is the final conviction that Grant himself is in the ring and knows all about it. Grant's failed presidency. Not only will you find out about the corruption and lies of U.S. Grant, but you'll find out about how he uh, corrupted Southern Reconstruction and became a radical republic. After saying he did not want blacks to vote, uh, short, you know, after the war, immediately after the war, he became a radical republican, wanted blacks to vote because it put him in office. It put him in office. In fact. He did not win a majority of the white popular vote to get in office the first time, notwithstanding that three Southern states could not vote at all and many white Southerners could not vote. The only way Grant got the, a win of the popular vote in 1868, which was his first time he was elected, was because of the ex-slave vote. 
That was it. Without that, he would have lost the white popular vote. Uh, so that's that's my story. That's Grant versus Lee. Now I, I hope you'll understand a little better about some of the work that's been going on behind the scenes for nearly 40 years to drink, bring down the reputation of Robert E. Lee and why it's happened. So for Philip Lee and Civil War Chat, uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.